The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod and we are webcasting to you live from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders headquarters in Tarzana, California. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm so thrilled this morning because we have some very special guests who are watching the show this morning. I'm going to talk about them in just a minute. But first, I want to remind you that this entire show is meant to be interactive. We hope that you will participate with us and let us know your thoughts, feelings, concerns, topics that you want us to cover because here we talk about autism from a 360 degree perspective. We're talking about how you treat autism, how we find hope, how we manage to work jobs and keep food on the table and deal with all the emotions that go along with autism because we all want to get to the progress that we know is possible in this community. So I, I'm thrilled that you're here and Emily is going to show you some of the different ways that you can interact with us. While she's doing that, I'll remind you that if you visit autism-live.com, that's our homepage. You can find our blog there, and you can also participate with us. If you click on the triangle that is on the computer screen, you could be watching the live show or the most recently recorded live show. And to the side of that, there are some white boxes. If you put your cursor in the white box uh, that says your question and you start typing and hit enter, it will show up here on my screen. And in that way, you and I can be having a conversation. And you can also ask questions of the many experts that we will have here on the show throughout the day. And we we do have a cavalcade of experts today. Really, really thrilling. We have not one expert, not two, but we have three different experts that are going to be with us. So I mentioned that we have some special guests watching the show today, and I, I have to give a wonderful shout out to the fourth graders of Mrs. Maynard. And I, I talk on the all the time on the show about the fact that it's important to give back to your child's school in a way that is appropriate for you. And for the last few years, each year I've been directing a play at my son's school and uh, we call it the Women in History Theater Project. As you know, as many of you know, March is Women in History Month and we've been able to take on this project and each year we create something that it's slightly different every year. And I have to say that I am so proud of this group this year. They have done a tremendous job and tonight is their final performance. They're doing, I believe, two performances today during the day, but then tonight they'll perform for their families. They've worked so hard. And I, I I always like to say, you know, it's important to give back. And the truth of the matter is, is that when I donate my time to the school, I find that I get twice as much as I give. These children have been remarkable. I, I You guys, if you're watching, I just want to tell you how proud I am of you, how excited I am to see your performance tonight, and how thrilling it's going to be to see your families see you in this light. How how, how beautiful your your work has been and how I've appreciated watching you all grow. On Monday, I got to see them do a dress rehearsal and there was an amazing moment when I saw them really get it and work together and take ownership of what they were doing. And it really, it brought me to tears. And I, I heard from your teacher that yesterday you did that much better. So I want to applaud you. I'm excited to see you tonight. And we want to give you a shout out for your remarkable work. Good luck. 
Uh, you know, as they say, uh, break a leg. And more than anything else, I want you guys to have fun tonight. And thank you for all of your hard work. Now, having said that, we have a lot we have to accomplish here on the show today. And as you guys know, I always like to remind you at the top of the show that while we have a bunch of experts who will come on the show, including today, I'm not an expert in autism. My experience in autism is that while I'm a former teacher, but with autism, I am a parent. My son was diagnosed with autism at the age of two and he is now 10. He is my pride and joy and the light in my life and he has been able to make tremendous progress because he had access to the right therapies. And I, I have a lot to pay forward so that's why I'm here to help you to get connected with the answers that you want about autism so that you can make the progress that you want whether you're working with a child because you're the parent, the teacher, or the practitioner or you yourself for on the autism spectrum. We know that there is progress to be made. And one of the first things that we do at the start of the show is what we call the jargon of the day. This is when we take on one word, one phrase, one acronym, and we give you the actual definition of it. And then we give you a working definition so that you can better understand what this term means within your world. So today, our term and our phrase is one of the ones that's the most contentious I find in the autism community. It is DTT. Now, what does that stand for? I, the first time I heard it, it sounded like a bug spray to me. I'm just going to be honest because it sounds a little bit like that, right? But DTT stands for discrete trial training. So let us bring up our actual definition of DTT and... Uh, we're, we're pausing for a second because I don't have the right one up here. Emily, do you have it? Uh, we, we have a technical uh, difficulty on my end. Emily's wonderful, so she has saved it. All right, here we go. So DTT, as I said, stands for discrete trial training. So our actual definition is training that focuses on a single cycle of behaviorally based instruction routine. And ladies and gentlemen, this is where the confusion begins, right? What on earth does that phrase mean? I have seen DTT. I understand what DTT is. And even I am confuddled by this definition. And this is why we take on jargon. So let's continue on to our working definition of DTT. DTT is a method of teaching that involves teaching one targeted behavior at a time. So if you think about trying to teach something to somebody that's really difficult, like let's say that we wanted to teach snowboarding. There are a great many things. I don't snowboard, but I know just from looking at it, there are a great many things involved in snowboarding. And maybe I could learn how to stand on a snowboard, but I, I don't, my balance isn't good enough, or I don't have a sense of how to make it move. There are so many different aspects of teaching snowboarding. Well, I know from uh, watching somebody teach my son how to skateboard that uh, one of the first things that they did was remove a bunch of elements and they isolated just one element of standing on the skateboard. So they took out uh, so many other distractions there were there were no wheels on the skateboard that they had him start on and they isolated that one moment so that he could get that one task. We do this all the time in life. We say we're not going to teach the whole thing at the same time. The first time that we teach people how to drive, a lot of times we don't do it in a car, right? We remove and isolate one element of the teaching moment so that we can be successful at that. And we can do that with a more complex task, too. Um, if we want to teach somebody how to uh, dive, we, we're probably not going to start at 500 feet, right? We, could, we can make it condensed and have them jump off of a, a diving board for three inches to start with, right? Uh, and there are lots of different ways. That we, but really, we're talking about isolating a moment of teaching and that's what DTT does. Now in order to get the skill completely 
you would never want to just do DTT. And I think a lot of times when people see a video of someone working with an individual uh, that's on the autism spectrum, a lot of times you see somebody sitting at a table and they're showing them something and saying, touch the car. And you see the child touch the car and everybody says, yay, that's great because they're reinforcing the child and they're teaching them the express, uh, excuse me, the receptive command of what to do when somebody says touch something and that this is a car. So they've heard it and they understand this is what I'm supposed to do is touch the car. Um, but if that's all we ever taught them and this is the only way in which we taught it, we would never really get anywhere significantly, right? So it's really important to me that everybody understands that DTT is a beginning teaching task. It's not the end. It's not even really the middle. If you want to teach something that's difficult, you might start with DTT and then eventually you're going to graduate into a real life circumstance and you want to involve natural environment training and then you want to work on fluency so that the individual gets to the point when they can ride down a mountain on a snowboard or they can skateboard across a parking lot and be successful at it. You would never stop with just the DTT of it, correct? And a lot of times people misunderstand and think that ABA and DTT are the same thing. They're not at all. DTT is one element of a quality ABA program one element. And, and the comparison that I always like to make is uh, you have a car and your car has a steering wheel, right? Well, in, in this analogy, the car is ABA and for DTT, the steering, the, the steering wheel is the DTT. So you would never want to drive your car without a steering wheel, right? You would never want to do it because it wouldn't be as productive. I think that uh, in almost all cases, we can benefit from a little bit of DTT in teaching a skill and in some cases we're going to need more than others but we would never say to somebody I'm going to drive to Vegas with just my steering wheel because you're not going to get there right there's no possibility that you can get to Vegas driving your steering wheel you need the car <laughs> so ABA is the car DTT is the steering wheel it's an important element of teaching absolutely important because it's so effective at teaching the beginning of beginnings of any skill that we want to teach but it is by no means the be all end all so when you see those videos of ABA and it and they're showing you a DTT moment please know that that's only part of the picture uh, and I encourage you to watch the a word so that you can see all of the elements of quality ABA you will see some DTT and you will see some natural environment training you will see some pivotal response training. You will see some fluency training, all of those different things, and many, many more different types of teaching skills will comprise a really quality ABA program. Okay. Uh, so having said that, we always like to kick off the show with a question for our viewers as well. And we will have a time in just a few minutes to look at your answers on Facebook. And our question today is how has your life changed since starting ABA therapy. And I really hope that those of you who have had the benefit of having ABA therapy will take a moment to write in on the Facebook and, and really own what your answer is. And I will tell you that it's really great when you do this for a couple of different reasons. First of all, when you say how your life has changed since ABA has started, it's a way of, of, of really stopping for a moment and reflecting on how you, far you have come. I have said before, that in the first year that my son was doing ABA, we were so busy and I was so worried and I was so concerned about where we were getting that sometimes I couldn't see the amount of progress that we had. And after, at the end of that first year, I was forced because they were doing evaluations and the school was doing evaluations to look at what the big picture was, how our lives had changed and how much progress my son had made. And when I was able to step back and look at it and go, oh my gosh, we're not having the difficulties that we had before, it really helped me to 
reinvest in what we were doing and work that much harder. And I do think that it's beneficial to do that and to express your gratitude, right? But there's a bigger picture here too, that there are many families out there who still haven't gotten ABA. And I will tell you that a lot of them, it's because the hardship of that they just can't afford it and we're all working so hard to be able to find the way to find the funding for those families. But those aren't the only families that aren't getting ABA. The real truth of it is that there are some families that are out there that have access, it even pains me to say it, that have access to ABA and have decided not to participate in it for a lot of different reasons. For some of them, it's because they can't afford the copay. They've got the coverage, but they can't afford the copay. And again, we're all pulling and working and trying to find funding sources and trying to s change legislation so that that doesn't happen. But still, there are other families that could be doing ABA and aren't doing it because they don't believe that it will be effective for their children and they need to hear our voices. They need to hear from all of us what we went through and how much better our lives are for having done this. Uh, there are some who have heard incorrect information or have, I recently was at an event and spent a good half hour talking to a parent who said, I, I'm not uninterested in ABA, but my wife has looked at some of the videos online and she doesn't think that it's realistic or that it will really help my child. And again, you know, I had to stop and say, I'm gonna guess that what your wife saw was DTT and anybody who just sees DTT will say to themselves, I don't know how this gets you to the point where your child can do the things you wanna do. Uh, and I encourage that dad to go home and have his wife watch the A word to see how you go from DTT to other things. So those of you who get it, who know and have had this happening in your home, I hope you'll share it on Facebook. Let other people know what they're missing when they're not participating in this. Uh, and again, for those of you who understand and want ABA and are working hard, I want you to know we have not forgotten you and there are a lot of us who are working really hard to find the way to get ABA to you. All right, so we will take a little bit of time uh, in a little while to take a look at your answers, and I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. My, and I will answer the question, too, a little bit later about how my life has changed. It is significantly different. Uh, I, that, that doesn't even begin to cover it. Every aspect of my life is different for having had a child who was on the spectrum who went through an early intensive behavioral intervention that was ABA-based. Every aspect of my life has changed, and I can tell you that all aspects were changed for the better. Um, and, I, and I'll go into that a little bit more. But in any case, we always have a topic of the week. Our topic this week is simply advances in behavioral treatment. Now, if you're just tuning in with us this week and you've never uh, seen our show before, I want to assure you that ABA is not the only thing we talk about here. In fact, next week we're going to be talking about a lot of different things, in particular medical things. Um, but we do talk about ABA here a fair amount because we do know that ABA is the only scientifically proven intervention that is significantly effective at creating progress for all of our kids on the spectrum. I don't want to mislead you. There are other things that have been shown to be effective with individuals right? Um, and, and especially in conjunction with ABA. But we know that ABA helps us to create progress and it doesn't matter what age the individual is. It does not matter what capabilities they have when they start ABA. We are going to be able to create progress. Is the progress going to look different? Is it going to be different? Are they all going to end up at different places on the spectrum? Yes, absolutely. And anybody who tries to tell you that there is a one size fits all, and if you do this, and if you do this, that your child will end here, um, it's not accurate. I, I don't have a crystal ball, and I don't know anyone who has an effective crystal ball. But we do know that all of the individuals that we give this intensive behavioral intervention to will be able to make progress.
they will. Um, so that is why we talk about ABA a lot, but it is by no means uh, the only game in town. It's just the one we're focusing on the most this week, but we will find time to talk about other things as well this week uh, because that's life. <laughs> so I want to give you uh, an idea of one of some of the things that we have going on this morning on the show. Really thrilled that we're going to have Cecilia Knight with us today. We talk about... Uh, in. Uh, the Institute for Behavioral Training. Uh, I was going to say IBT because that's what it is for short. The Institute for Behavioral Training. And you can find their website at ibehavioraltraining.com. And Cecilia is the director of IBT. And we're thrilled that we're going to be having her join us via Skype to talk about something new and interesting and really pivotal, something that has the ability to change how ABA is delivered here in the United States. Uh, there is a new def there is a new determination for individuals who are trained and working with kids on the spectrum. Uh, it's called being a registered behavior technician. We've been talking to you about BCBAs uh, since the beginning of time, uh, but the BACB has that new designation at RBT, registered behavior technician. And it's going to change the way a lot of things look, and I'm excited about it. So we're going to we're we're going to be talking with Cecilia about how someone becomes a registered behavior technician. I'm really excited. Uh, in the second hour, we've got two wonderful, wonderful guests. Dr. Jonathan Tarbox will be back with us this week, and we call that science beat with Dr. Tarbox, and he's going to be talking about some of the science, some of the new science behind behavior behavioral interventions. So very excited to be talking about that. And he also will answer questions that you guys have. And then at the very end of the show today, to end out the week, we have got a really fabulous young woman. Sarah Gershfeld is going to be with us. And she has a new website called Love My Provider. And she's going to be talking to us about why we're going to want to take a trip to that site to uh, talk about our feelings about what's happening in our home and to check out other services is that we're interested in having in our home or taking our child to that we want to get a really good review of. And that's just one of the things that happens on Love My Provider. So she'll be with us uh, right towards the end of the program. It's going to be an exciting show. I'm really looking forward to it. So stick with us. Hi, I'm Ryan with Autism Research Group. We study ways to improve the lives of kids with autism. One of those ways is teaching safety skills, such as what to do if they get lost. We hit the streets to find out if anybody knows the correct answer on how to teach a kid what to do if they get lost. You're teaching a child. What to do if they get lost. Yeah, you're trying to okay. make them independent so they have the skills. Gotcha, okay. Well, give them a compass. Code name's good idea, Centurion. We always have this whistle. Um. Oh, I'd also out, tell the kid, I tell the kid, don't get scared. It's all you're gonna be all right, man. This is just the world. You're this is planet Earth. You're at home here. As long as you're on planet Earth, you're at home. As long as you're on planet Earth, you're home. This guy's a genius. With that flawless logic, he just solved our homeless problem. And as for the unique sounding whistle, although very cool, it'll probably only work if you're in close proximity. And a compass. I have her call me. Yeah, she doesn't have a phone. Parents are like, you're too young, you don't need a phone. Establish some sort of like meeting place. What if they can't find a meeting place? Because sometimes Ooh. the kids get nervous when they get lost. Yeah. So like a backup plan. Well, like well, plan B. Yeah, I don't know. No, not really. Let them go and find a new kid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got a different one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's not much you can do. There is I stuff like... you can do. Like... That's right, there is stuff you can do. In 2012, myself, along with my colleagues, Dr. Jonathan Tarbox and Dr. Adele Nadowski, published a study in the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis on teaching kids what to do when they get lost. The study demonstrated how three simple things, rules, role playing, and praise, were effective in establishing these help-seeking behaviors. The benefit of this method is it doesn't require the child to have a cell phone or to have to locate a meeting place, which might be difficult if they're in a place like Disneyland. So once again, our method included rules, role playing, and praise. Let's head back outside and learn about some of these rules. They should yell out loud. Can't find my mom, my mom, help me. Maybe yell out and scream for help. 
All right. Scream really loud. Correct. And if that doesn't work, then... I don't know. Well, they could seek help from someone. Find an adult. Yeah, go to a vendor, you know, and say I'm lost. Uh, Find an adult, like a police officer or a fireman or an employee in the store, and tell them, and maybe they can help you contact your parent. It really is that simple. You don't need to get your kid a cell phone. You don't need to establish a meeting place that they might not be able to find when they're lost and panicking. And you definitely don't need to give them a compass. All your kid has to do is three things. First, yell mom or dad real loud. Two, if that doesn't work, find an employee. And then third, tell the employee they're lost. If they can't locate an employee, then tell them to find a mother with children because that's probably the safest person to approach. I'm not saying that most men are predators, but most predators are men. That is a fact. I've read it in a fortune cookie. All right, so you've gone over the rules with your kid and you've quizzed them and they're able to tell you the correct responses so they understand the rules. But is that enough? How do you know they're gonna perform correctly in a real world setting? You need to get out there and find out if they can actually do it. So you'd go over the rules and tell them like, do this, do that, but how would you know if they actually knew what to do? If you wanted to shoot a basketball and I just told you, oh, when you shoot a basketball, do this, this, and this. I never, never practice. You never practice. Yeah, so it doesn't matter how many times we go over the rules or how well you can repeat them back to me. It's not going to change until you get on the court and practice. Maybe do uh, like a, you know, a little skit with them. Like a role play. Like... Role play. Yeah. Your child, you're lost in the toy aisle. Okay. What do you do? I'm an attendant walking around. <laughs> I'm lost. I don't know where my mom is. And then once you practice, you just like praise them, give them feedback, like good job, you did it. Reinforcing it. Yes, this woman wins the prize for best comment. She pointed out the most important part of learning, reinforcement. Now, in our study, we used praise, but for your kid, you might have to use something else. You might have to buy them a treat, a toy, take them to their favorite restaurant where they can eat unhealthy food and run around and climb through plastic tunnels that have the unmistakable scent of urine and then play games spending $20 to get a plastic little spider ring that they will eventually lose in the ball pit. The point is, you need to reward your child for correctly demonstrating what you've been teaching them. Okay, I'm gonna call her. Uh, hello, your child, Ryan, <laughs> which is a mistake. Yay! So you tested it out a in child. the store <laughs> to make sure I knew it. I had the rules, yes. we role played it and you made sure I knew it, and then like you said, good job, and all that. Now we're good to go. We're good to go. All right. Done? High five right there. <laughs> yeah. So there you have it. Give your child the rules, get out there and practice, and reward your child for responding correctly. For more information, please visit us online at autismresearchgroup.org. I'm Ryan Bergstrom. Thanks for watching. Yes, ding, no. <laughs> yes, this woman wins the first, yes, this woman, yes, this woman wins the best, yes, this woman wins the first place, yes, this woman, why can't I say what? Yes, this woman wins, what's the line? Yes! Welcome back to Autism Live. We had a question come in from our very good friend, Mike Hipple, yesterday. And Mike, I, if you're watching, I promised that I was going to email you, and I am going to email you and direct you to this episode because I thought about what you said, and, and I was going to take the time to write it all back to you, but I found the most tremendous site that I really wanted to share it with everyone. And what Mike wrote yesterday, um, he said, I'm speaking about autism to a sixth grade class next Tuesday for Autism Awareness Month, and I don't know what I want to have in my speech and what videos to show them. Can you help me? And then he went on to say, and we need to have four to five middle school books with a character who has autism to read after their vacation. Any ideas? And I was saying yesterday, Yesterday, I, I must have been having a hot flash or something. Uh, I couldn't remember things that I love, even. You know, I think if you'd asked me my name yesterday, I wouldn't have known whether I was coming or going. <laughs> You know how you have those days? Uh, in any case, I was sitting here with Dr. Grand Pache and I said, you know, there's that book with the girl in it. Why can't I think what the name of it is? And how ridiculous, because as soon as I looked up uh, and found it, and it led me to another site 
to a whole bunch of books that I can't wait to see. But the book I was trying to think of was Mockingbird. Um, and Mockingbird is written by Catherine Erskine. It's spelled E-R-S-K-I-N-E, -E, and it's Catherine with a K and a Y. Um, and a uh, wonderful, wonderful book about a girl who is on the autism spectrum uh, and, and getting into her mind. Lovely, lovely, lovely book. And as the person, this person, who I'm going to talk about in a second, uh, writes, the narrative is so tight, you feel like you're right in the room with her, deep and touching. This is enlightened reading at its best. So great book. And it's, uh, I have seen kids reading that as young as third grade. So um, Mockingbird, great book. But the site that I found, Mike Hipple, and for all of you who are interested, who have teens and um, that you want to educate or teens that you want to help to feel like they're not alone, uh, I found this wonderful site, Nerdy Book Club dot wordpress.com and on that site the uh, they have a lovely blog that was written by Carrie Cox Carrie you rock and I'm not going to share everything on this because I want people to go to this site nerdy bookclub.wordpress.com and her the name of her blog is top 10 books featuring autism spectrum disorders by Carrie, C-A-R-R-I-E Cox, okay? And uh, maybe we can put up the link to this on our um, Facebook page. But amazing they've got 10 books here that uh and they're rated um there there are some here that i had never heard of there's one called anything but typical and that's included in um middle grade fiction i had heard of al capone, al capone does my shirts but i've not yet read it uh the london eye mystery which looks really good they talk about um Mockingbird, and this uh, rules, which is a Newbery Honor book, uh, and and they and she says it's probably the most re widely recognized in the category. Uh, Readers will sympathize and cheer during Catherine's journey to understand and accept her little brother, David, who is autistic. So if you have somebody in your family that has a sibling issue and they're a middle schooler, this is going to be a great book. Uh, she goes on to say middle, uh, excuse me, sibling issues and family dynamics are at the core. So every reader can relate. Uh, I just am absolutely thrilled by this long list of books. And of course, under teen fiction, one of the other books that I'm really familiar with, but I, it's really for teenagers, I wouldn't give it to middle schoolers, is The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Night, in the Nighttime, excuse me, by Mark Haddon. A great, great book, and I really encourage parents, it's a great read, first of all. It's a mystery, and the leading character um, is uh, on the spectrum, and it's told from his point of view. And the author is not someone who is on the spectrum, but my goodness, um, for people who are very visual thinkers, you need to read it. It's, it's a very exciting book, but there are some very adult issues in that book. So I would not give that to anyone unless they are a much older teen uh, or an adult. Um, so I definitely wouldn't do that. And there was at least, and of course they have a T Temple Grandin's book on here too. Um, and there was at least one book in here that I was not familiar with. Um, it's, it's called Freaks, Geeks, and Asperger's Syndrome. And um, this is not uh, a fiction book, but um, I guess that there are elements of fiction in it because it's told from uh, a narrator's point of view, but the person who wrote it is actually 13 years old and on the spectrum. Uh, and I understand that it's really fun and a good read. So there are some books uh, for, for us to read in that middle age range. Uh, so let us know if you've read any of these books and you love them or if you've had your child read them. And I do recommend if you're looking for a book for your child that you read it yourself first or read with your child. There is nothing more exciting uh, than reading with your child. It's something that I, I thoroughly, thoroughly adore. People were making fun of me because last summer we were we started out, we were reading the Laura Ingalls Wilder books and people were saying to me, you know, you got to you know, get him to mench up a little bit and you're reading the girl. I think it's great to read all of those books, uh, whether it's a boy or a girl. I think, I think we should all loosen up our ideas of what it means to be a boy and what it means to be a girl. Um, and he learned so much. Uh, we, we did not get through all of them yet. <laughs> and of course, 
the book, uh, and we read this years ago, and I want to reread it with him again, but, you know, my favorite book of all time, uh, the great Madeline Lingle, A Wrinkle in Time. And, and I will say that I think everyone should have to read A Wrinkle in Time, but if you have boys, there is a, a, a lesser known of her books that uh, it's not considered part of the Wrinkle in Time trilogy, it, but it still involves the same family, and it's called Many Waters, really a book that boys get into. And it's all about they the two boys travel back in time to be there when Noah is getting ready to load the ark. It's it's a little out there, but it's it's very interesting. It's a good read. And that's Madeline Langle, the great, late, late, great Madeline Langle, uh, who I'm so thrilled that I had an opportunity to meet ever so briefly before she passed away. Brilliant brilliant woman. All right. We're going to take a break. We're going to come back and look at some of your answers to the question of the day. We asked you, how has your life changed since starting ABA therapy? And we've had some people be honest. And one of them in particular that I want to talk about what she said, because it's what a lot of people say. And, and I want to, I want to help to see if we can't shift this. So stick with us. We'll be right back. Hello there, fellow activist. You're an activist because you're making the world a better place for someone living with autism. Now on Autism Live, you learn all about your children. You learn about their bodies and their brains. But this empowerment moment is all about you. It's about your heart and your soul. Now don't worry, I'm not gonna have you start singing Kumbaya or doing chanting. Let's talk about blessings. One of the blessings of living with a child with autism is learning to love them unconditionally. Learning to love them despite all the ups and downs, all the sacrifices. In fact, you learn to love them more so because of them. I call this my empowerment prayer. God grant me the wisdom to see my disability as an opportunity, the courage to love my child unconditionally and the faith to live a life of purpose. So going from the sublime to the ridiculous, I have a little song for you today. It's a rap song, so I know that an old or, okay, middle-aged white woman rapping just doesn't seem right, but I'm gonna go for it anyway. My style is a little like Nicki Minaj meets Dr. Seuss. Nancy's Autism Rap. It's just a diagnosis, your life's not over. Don't lay there like a dog, get up, Rover. You say your head is spinning with GF, CF, ABA, IEPs, and neurofeedback? Autism tough, that much is true, but you'll survive because you're you. Your life's not over, it's just begun, so walk out that door and go be someone. More Dr. Seuss than Nicki Minaj. Until next time. Stay strong and keep the faith. Welcome back to Autism Live. We ask you guys a question every day. And, and we do this for a lot of different reasons. Sometimes we want uh, ideas from you guys for topics that we're going to cover here on the show. Other times it's because we have other entities that are asking questions and we want to know your opinion. And sometimes I want to give you guys an opportunity to sound off. And sometimes I want to give you an opportunity to uplift yourself and to uplift other people in the community. So, um, and, and that's really what I was going for for today, both the ability to sound off and the ability to uplift yourself and other people in the community. Our question today was, how has your life changed since starting ABA therapy? Now, we did have somebody write in and say, you know, so independent now, he can almost fully dress himself at four and a half years old. And I think hearing those specifics are so awesome because, um, a lot of times people take that kind of stuff for granted. If it just happens, you know, for for people who have neurotypical kids and there's a moment when they're, you know, two and three where they're getting more independent so that by the time they're four and a half, they're pretty, you know, you can leave the pile of clothes and they can pretty much do it themselves. And people don't think about how much time that saves you, how much self-esteem that gives the child and how, how much it lifts you up and starts your day off right. Because if you don't have it, 
it. Like so many of the things that we struggle with when our kids are on the autism spectrum, if you don't have it, it it can be so draining on the spirit and it's draining physically. The older a child gets when you're having to wrestle them to get them into clothes, it's exhausting. Or if it's not that you're not having to wrestle them to do it, not physically have to, but to have to prompt and and to keep massaging and to, you know, to do all those things to get the child. It's a lot of energy. Energy that you'd like to put into other things, right? And and then you get into just the emotional part of it of, oh, you know, we're not at this point yet. And then it starts to just pull, pull, pull down. So I think it's great when we talk about these things that a lot of times other people will take for granted. Because at this point, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, and I don't think that at four and a half that my son could even almost fully dress himself. We weren't anywhere near that at four and a half. I'm just keeping it real here and being honest. But now that he's 10, he can completely dress himself. Yes, I have to come sometimes. He's, you know, we're still working on lining up the seams of his pants because he'll put on his pants and they are twisted in a way that if I had to walk in them, I would, I would cry. I would just cry. And, and so I still have to prompt him to get you know, the pants, uh, he really loves to wear pants with, uh, elastic in the waist and not the, the waistband with the button and all of that stuff. And he does sometimes wear those, but he prefers elastic in the waist. And I, you know, I cater to that, but the waistband will be, you know, turned to the side and, you know, he's got crazy looking pants on and I still have to prompt there. Right. But that is so vastly different than where we were at four and a half. Uh, and I take it for granted. I forget sometimes how amazing it is that he can do that and that he's starting at 10, almost 11 to take pride in, you know, smoothing out the shirt, that part he's got, the pants, he, yeah, you know, we're just not there, uh, but that's okay. We will. Now, somebody else had already written in this morning and their response. And I, and I, and I want to start out by saying that I love this parent. I love their honesty. I appreciate because we have all felt the way this parent feels. And I in no way want to make it sound like, um, that I disagree with this parent because I, I don't. Um, this is a hard thing to do ABA, but I want to help all of us to realize why it's worth it and how we make it work. So what she said was we actually discontinued ABA for our son. It was just too, and she wrote that all in caps, much. He was having a really hard time going to school all day, then immediately to therapy for a few more hours. He made a lot of progress during his summer sessions of ABA, though. I just wish there was a way to get it with add, without adding hours to his already stressful work day. And, and she made a mm, face, right? So uh, sending you an air hug because we have all felt that way, right? It, it, it's, it is a lot. It is a lot. And I loved a couple of weeks ago, we had Dr. Jonathan Tarbox here and he was talking about just that thing about it's a lot. And he, the Olympics were on and he said, let's stop for a second and think about if you were preparing for the Olympics and, and what would you have to go through and how much training. And I've seen families that were training for the Olympics. And I have thought to myself, my good, that's too much. That is too much. And, and the reality of it is um, it's a lot and it's stressful and it's hard on the whole family. I am not going to candy coat it for you, but I want you to hear what you said, that he makes a lot of progress during the summer. And what you're saying is, I wish there was a way to get it without adding hours to his already stressful work day. What if we turn this on its side? What if we tried to figure out how do we make his work day, a fun day and reduce some of the stress for him. Now I know I believe me, I understand. And please remember that, you know, my child did this for five years. So, uh, and I don't know what your individual challenges are, but I know how hard it is to ask a child to go to school all day and then come home and do an additional two to three hours of therapy. And I went through that stress with my son as well. And we had some kickback. We had to up our game. We had to make the therapy in the afternoon exciting. 
We had to talk to the school about making ways that we could make it less stressful at school, and I was not willing to compromise on the academics. I, and, I, and I will say that there are parents who have said, I'm going to let some of the academic thing goes go for now until we get these other things in place. I was not one of those parents. I wasn't willing to give up on those things. But there is a way. And, and if you wanted to call, you know, if you want to give me your number, we can call and we can figure it out. Because I hear a parent mourning the progress. And we don't get this time to do over. Um, but there is a way. Families have been finding a way to make it less stressful for a child going to school and make it really fun doing the therapy. We upped our game, uh, you know, it was like throw down challenge. How can we make this the most exciting thing that it can be? We did play dates, we went on field trips, uh, you know, anything that we were doing and using therapy, we were, you know, doing it with video games, during video games, video games being the reinforcer, whatever it was to make it happy. I. I'm confident that there's a way, and and I and I I see your you know your your half frowny face, uh, and I hear you saying that the progress was made. So, I, my question to you is: Would you be willing to open your mind to see if there's a way that we could achieve the very thing that you're wishing for, which is to find the way to make it all work and not add hours of stress to your child? I believe it can be done. I really do, and I'd be happy to help you try to figure it out. So uh, keep writing in and, and let's all, you know, think about it. How has our life benefit, benefited from ABA and how can we make it work? That's really what it all comes down to at the end of the day. Now, we got to take a break because we have a very special guest who's going to be talking with us about a very special new designation for therapists. So we're going to take a break and we're going to be back with Cecilia Knight from the Institute for Behavioral Training. Stick with us. Hi guys, welcome back to Smarty. This month we're gonna make some gluten-free Play-Doh. It's a great activity because A, I know a lot of our kids have an allergy to gluten, and B, it's super cheap and cost-effective to make your own. So let's get started. The materials you'll be needing are one cup of white rice flour, half a cup of cornstarch, half a cup of salt, one tablespoon of cream of tartare, one and a half teaspoons of vegetable oil, one cup of water, food coloring, a saucepan, and a spatula. So as you guys can see, I'm in my kitchen because I'm going to be using the stove top to make the Play-Doh. First what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my pot and fill it up with all the dry ingredients, okay? Now that I have my dry ingredients in the saucepan, I'm now going to add the what ones, the vegetable oil and water. I'm going to turn the pan onto low heat and continue stirring. What I want to make sure happens is that it gets solidified and gooky looking, you'll see in a second, but not overcooked, okay? You're just trying to get the materials to kind of congeal. You know the dough is ready. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna just take it off the stove top and let it cool. Once it's cool, then you're gonna add your coloring and boom, you've got gluten-free Play-Doh. Well, I hope you enjoyed the Play-Doh with your kids. Until next time, Craft On Guys. Can you see me? Flying by your side. Welcome back to Autism Live. We have a very special guest with us, Cecilia Knight, who is the director of the Institute for Behavioral Training. And you've seen her before on our show, and especially we had we had filmed some segments with her. She is remarkable. Uh, she's a, rem a remarkable woman who's been working in the field of autism for a really long time. I don't even want to guess how long, because she looks so young. But first of all, Cecilia, welcome back to Autism Live. Thank you, and thank you for having me here. I appreciate it. So thrilled to have you here. And we talk about IBT, the Institute for Behavioral Training, on this show a lot. I think it's remarkable, and thank you so much for this service that you have done for our community, giving us a way that we can learn what we need to learn without having to leave our homes. Thank you so much. 
Yeah, we love the opportunity to um, speak to parents or teachers or professionals, and we actually really like that we can be in your home live with the click of a button. So thank you. We enjoy doing what we do. It really is remarkable. And we asked you to come today to talk about this new designation, uh, the Registered Behavior Technician. Tell us what that is and why it's so important. Well, it's a pretty exciting thing for our field because um, what the BACB has proposed is a new level, basically, of certification for therapists. And this would be the direct staff working one-on-one -on -one with a child or student with autism. And so this, this credential really allows um, a new group to be certified and receive some really quality training and to have some ongoing monitoring, which is really nice for this level um, of employee or staff person. Yeah, and it's really remarkable because uh, we're seeing as laws are passed in different states and insurance companies are covering things, people are asking for some accountability that the people who are working with the children have a certain level of training, correct? Right, and it's really important because um, obviously therapists are going into family homes or into school settings, and for a long time, funding sources have been asking for a certification for this level of staff. And of course, um, we feel like it's only positive um, the more requirements that um, we have for staff going in to work with individuals in their homes or in their school setting. We feel like that's a positive thing, and we'll give a little bit more um, guarantee, I guess, or satisfaction to parents or funding sources who are interested in ensuring that those folks do have appropriate training. And so, correct me if I'm wrong, you guys have created a training that meets the requirements to become a registered behavior technician, and you that's available now online. Somebody could start their training to get this qualification today. That's right. We um, looked to the board's requirement when they put them out, and we felt like it was really important to address these training topics, and we released our um, e-learning um, at the beginning of March. And so we do have the 40 hours that are required for an employee, a staff person, um, to go through this training to become a registered behavior technician. And and it, it's separated into different modules, yes. and you can buy them individually, or you can buy and pay for the whole training all at once, correct? Yes, and the thing that's really nice about the way the certification is set up is it doesn't limit an agency, for example, to going to an outside source for all the 40 hours. For example, um, a clinic could decide that they're going to provide 10 hours of the training to their employee, but maybe they don't have time to finish the rest of the 30 hours. And so they can combine training that they purchase from IBT or from some other entity with training that they are also doing as long as it's, as it's being provided by a BCBA and as long as it meets the criteria that the board has set forth. Well, I would, be, I would think that everyone who is doing ABA therapy right now who's not a BCBA would be scrambling to get this designation, to get qualified as an RBT. And, and we want to encourage them. They can go to ibehavioraltraining.com. And, and where do they need to go from there, Cecilia? Well, we have a, a tab actually that is um, set aside for registered behavior technicians and they can just click right on that tab. And the other thing I wanted to tell you is, um, you're right, a lot of people are scrambling, Shannon, but a lot of people have questions. Mm. And in our development of this product, we had questions too. As practitioners, we wondered, you know, how is this going to work? How can I implement this with my own therapy staff? And so, um, while we were creating this product, we came up with a long list of questions ourselves, and we're offering um, free webinars for individuals who are interested to just learn more. Um, and we have actually been booked. All those webinars so far have been booked, so we've offered more. And really, the folks who are most interested are those people who are running clinics, behavior analysts who employ therapists, have a lot of questions for us. And so it's really been a nice forum to get practitioners from across the country on the same web call to just talk about the registered behavior technician certification and to discuss 
why it might be important or um, to discuss valid questions that practitioners have about the certification. And so how can somebody find out where to be and when to be for a webinar? Also on our website, if you just check under the registered behavior technician area, you should be able to find a link. And if I've misspoken about that, you can email Catherine at ibehavioraltraining.com and she can sign you up or I guess put you on one of our waiting lists that we have to come to one of those webinars. We are finding it's pretty popular. So that's exciting to us. It's very exciting. But I would think too, in this economy, when there are, we have people who write into us on a weekly basis and say, I want to begin to work in the field of autism. It might be a parent or a teacher who says, you know, I, I want more information and you already have, we should be very clear, you have trainings specifically for parents and you have training specifically for teachers but if they want to have a career in the field of autism they also could take this course and get certified as a registered behavior technician that's right the minimum requirements are that someone is 18 years of age has a high school diploma or an equivalent and passes a criminal background check and then they have to take 40 hours of training whether that's with IBT which we of course hope you'll do that or they can get training with the BCBA who's supervising them and then they have to pass a competency which is really a nice feature of this certification because it ensures that individuals actually can implement the information that they've learned with an individual with autism or with any individual that they're working with. And then they pay a $50 fee. And if they've um, completed all those requirements, then the board will certify them as a registered behavior technician for one year. Love it. And then I imagine that there will be continuing education credits down the road that they'll have to do to renew their license. Exactly. Or yeah. certification. Yeah, the feature that's so nice and I think will help parents really get on board with this is that um, it requires that that registered behavior technician be affiliated with a BCBA. So they have to be continually gathering mentorship from a BCBA throughout the year. So it really ensures another level of professionalism and really professional guidance because yes, they are certified but they're required to be under the supervision of a more qualified practitioner. And so it's a really nice feature and 5% of their work for the entire year has to be supervised by a BCBA. And, and I have to say, you know, you mentioned you hope that they do it with IBT and let's go over some of the reasons why they should do it with IBT. You have a lineup of people who have extensive experience who lead these trainings, correct? Of course, and um, one of the things right now, uh, we're the only product that is available today to have 40 hours of training ready to go. So you're right, someone could start their training today. One of the things to remember is that you have to complete the 40 hours of training within a 90 day period, and that's the board's requirement. So of course we want people to come to us because if they wanna start today, we're really the place that they would have to come. And um, we have, of course, followed the board's guidelines, but after working in the field for about 20 years, um, we outlined some additional features that we think that um, therapists will really like. Um, I have my list in front of me. Um, we have a module on man training, so teaching basic requesting skills, which is really a popular module that we have. And one of the required features that the board placed was um, understanding client confidentiality and ethics, which we love because it really lifts this level of staff person or therapist to a higher level because now they're really understanding the important features of dealing with patients. There's I, a module. Okay. Oh, go ahead. ahead. No, 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 you go ahead. I was just gonna say, I love this. I am so excited about this because we need some quality assurance in yes. the field of autism. Yes. And, and, I, and I'm thrilled that you guys have taken this on because I know you are all about quality and getting that quality ABA. So uh, this is remarkable. But there was another one, that, another module that you wanted to tell us about. I was just saying one of the things the board outlined was teaching the direct line therapist um, prevention of crisis behavior. And so you'll find that as well. And then another Another one you'll find in our product that you may not see other places is really an explanation on establishing operations and motivative operations, which is a higher level topic, but we really feel like 
the therapist needs to understand all of these key features in order to be a really great therapist. So you'll find quite a few topics. Um, of course, the ones you might expect on reinforcement and dealing with problem behavior, but we've added some other key features that we think really make our product stand out. Well, I, I love this new designation. I love this training. I love that more of our therapists that are, that are going out into homes are going to be more prepared. And I can only hope that at some point they require that anyone who works with a child in a classroom have to go through this training too. That would really make me excited. <laughs> I, I think it's really, um, I think it's a positive move for our field. And I think that many of us have been waiting for a while because we um, as BCBAs understand that the, the person making the daily behavior change with the child or with the teenager is that therapist or is that classroom aide or classroom teacher. So getting them training and certification, high level professional training to me is just a win for everyone involved. So I'm really excited about it too. And again, we want to encourage people to go to ibehavioraltraining.com. There are many things that you will find there. There are, there are many tabs. The one that we're talking about right now is registered behavior technician, but also notice that there is a tab for teachers, there are a tab for parents, and there are a tab for professionals. Um, and, and I love that you guys don't discriminate and anyone can go in and purchase any of these trainings um, so that if you if, if you want something that's a little more advanced as a parent you can and your trainings start as low as seven dollars and fifty cents a module yeah we think they're pretty valuable but one of our ideals um, as practitioners who've been in the field for a while is we really felt like accessibility was really important. And it's important to us that a parent who's in crisis can literally sit down on their iPad and for $7 watch something that we see as valuable. And, um, you know, of course, we feel like the information is very valuable, but we wanted to make sure it was accessible. So that's really important to us. And, and, that, and your trainings are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Really, really remarkable. You can do it in your home. I, all I can say is how I wish I had had the ability to have that in my hands when my son was diagnosed. Yeah. You, you've created a new world for us, and I, I really want to thank you. Sure. It's sure. remarkable. And we, you know, I feel the same way. As a as a beginning therapist many years ago, I, w I was always looking for new information. So I think it's exciting no matter what perspective you're taking with autism, whether you're the therapist or the teacher or the parent, I think it's exciting to have all this information, you know, at your fingertips. It is. And, and I, I do want to say to our viewers too, take advantage of what you need, but also refer the other people who are interacting, refer your child's teacher, Re refer, if you have an ABA provider, be talking to them about, are there people that, that are come the people that are coming to your home, are they registered behavior technicians? Uh, and let them know that there is an easy way that they can get this certification starting today yes at ibt ibehavioraltraining.com cecilia thank you so much we know you have tons of work to get back to but uh again thank you for taking the time to be with us thank you shannon all thank right you, me. you have a good day okay take care bye-bye bye, -bye. bye really remarkable uh if you haven't already been on ibt's site you you really want to go there and tootle around and just look at some of the different topics go to the category that you like if you want to go to parents go to parents or if you're having a tough time at school go to the teacher tab and look at the different trainings that they have for the teachers check out the registered behavior technician tab as well but I guarantee you, you're gonna, it's, it's kind of like being a kid in a candy store. You go there and you go, oh, I want this. Oh, I want that. And you know what I always say here, your team is only as strong as its weakest member. And I don't know about you, but I have I, it's been my thing from the beginning. I don't want that to be me, right? So IBT gives you the way that you can lift the level of your team today and very cost effective. So uh, definitely check it out. We have to take a break now and go to the A word. This is an ongoing documentary being made by the Center for Autism and Related Disorders following a little boy, Jack Riley, as he 
goes through his early intensive behavioral intervention. There's so much to be learned about ABA, including our jargon for the day, DTT, by watching this series. At this point in the series, Jack Riley is making progress. He's already about a month and a half, two months in, and we're seeing that, you know, sometimes he's struggling with understanding things are going to work differently, but we're already seeing progress. So take a look. This is the A word. This is Jack's morning routine. He just got out of bed. He's a happy guy. He's sitting with dad, drinking some milk, watching some tunes. Hi, Jack. Good morning. Good morning. How old are you, Jack? Two. Jack. Can you say good morning? Good morning. Good morning. Good. That's good. That's good. Sometimes she arranges the coins lately. Been uh, used to just put them straight in the piggy bank, and now he likes to play with them and arrange them. Nice. Talking. There Good you talking, go. Buddy. Good asking. Good asking. Yeah, definitely his two syllables are just yeah. coming along really well. Yeah. I mean, they're all, most of them are pr approximations, but they're the same every time. Yeah. He's a little sedate today, actually. I'm surprised. <coughs> Excuse me. Gets concerned when I sneeze and cough. Daddy, are you okay? Daddy. Yeah, I'm okay. Oh, you see that? See that? It Cheryl that's thought Cheryl so thought on that. Can you say I love you? That's I love you. Bye. Save every time. It's kind of like yellow, but yeah. yellow doesn't melt us like that. What is it? Pants. Very good. Here you go. Here you go. He's doing a lot of imitating things. And um, in clinic the other day, we were um, we noticed that every time he said, look at me, he'd repeat it, but in his own way. So it, sound, it comes out as baby. So every time he said, look at me, he's like, baby, baby. What is it? Pants. It is a train. We'll play with it in just a second, okay? Hey, look at me. 
Now look at me. Right here. There are your eyes. What is it? Hands. Okay, you can go. Good job. Okay, go play. Do you want the book or the trains? Book or trains? Trains. Okay, good. Go play. Go play with your trains. Go ahead. You can go play now. Oh, you want to look at the pictures? More? More pictures? Here, you can look at the pictures. Here. Want to show Suzanne what you know? How about let's look at the ones that you do know? Those are the ones that you don't Bunny. know. Bunny. Bunny. Wow, this is a lot more than I thought. <laughs> What's that one? Fish. You are so smart. Touch it. Tiger. Nice. Good job. Okay, what else? What's this one? Ellie. Ellie. Oh, gonna go there. A. Elephant. Getting closer. Lion. Lion. You do know a lot of animals. Between last week and today, Jack is able to label more cards. He's interested in identifying the images and consequently building his vocabulary. As the weeks progress in his ABA therapy, so has his skills. In two months, he's gone from babbling to enunciating certain words clearly. With prompting, he's able to practice appropriate speech when playing and requesting objects. Eventually, the prompting will fade and he will do it on his own. Each new skill acquired builds on the previous one. You're interested again? Here, why don't you go over there? Go over here and you can see better. Train. What's that? Train. Oh, you want to move it for me? Show me your train. Yeah, move it. Welcome back to Autism Live. Uh, just want to take a second to talk about what we're what we're seeing there, and and kind of how that jives with everything we've been talking about this week and what we were just talking about with Cecilia Knight. So did you love? I love this particular episode because there, it's just packed with different things that we, jargon and things that we need to understand when we're working with a child who's not yet fully verbal, and that isn't necessarily just a three year old. It could be later as well. I, I love that moment when the the therapist is talking to the dad about manding and the dad says i'm sorry what did you say <laughs> And, and the therapist says, oh, you know, manding, as if it's something, and I love that therapist. She actually was a therapist who worked with our son, but it's something that happens with jargon. Once people understand something, it feels like everybody understands it, right? Um, when none of us knew what manding was before we had a child with autism, and, and it took me a long time, even after my child was diagnosed with autism, to understand what that meant. And we included it in our jargon, right? But I love the dad's reaction because it's pretty much the reaction that almost every parent has at some point when somebody says, oh, yes, we're working on manding with your child. You're, I'm sorry, you're working on what? What? And then they say, manding. Uh, you know, and then you have to say, and what exactly is that? <laughs> Right? Uh, it's just that perfect encapsulated moment of this is what it's like starting into the jargon for ABA and you're worried about, you know, I want my child to talk and people are using terms that you have no idea what they mean. But um, it is key to begin to understand. And when I think back about if I had understood earlier, really understood instead of acting like I understood, because I asked questions and I got answers and I went, uh-huh, a lot. And then I would go look things up and that was a lengthy process. I wish that I had understood in a, in a much easier way. I'm sure I could have been a better member of the team. And, and I do wanna say that instead of just looking things up on the internet or taking the therapy time to have the discussion, and it's totally okay to do that, by the way, to say to the therapist, what are you working on? Why are you doing, you can do that. We all know that that will take away time from them actually doing it, but it's perfectly okay to do that. But if you if you feel like sometimes I did that, I don't want to take away from the therapy time for you to take me to school, you can go to eye behavioral training and they have extensive things on what manding is and how to teach uh, manding, how to encourage manding. And they have it 
from the perspective of a parent, they have uh, a module that's, you know, how to encourage your child to begin speaking to you and to request things. So they don't even use the jargon and they'll introduce that, the, the, the phrase manding. Um, but then they have it for teachers and they have it for practitioners. And now they have it for that registered behavior technician. How do you actually go about encouraging manding? It's very funny because this morning when my son was having breakfast, he loves blackberries and I, I bought some frozen blackberries and I wanted to thaw them so they got really juicy in the bowl and he had a brand new shirt on and I didn't want him to get it all over the shirt and uh, so we were having a joke about what were we going to do because he's a boy and it was going to end up on the brand new shirt and uh, and I said oh let mama feed you like I used to when you were a baby and he of course was like ma you know what are you doing uh, and I had great fun with it I and I went completely overboard with it uh, but I went over and I said, here's for the baby bird, which is what I would always say to him when he was little and in the, the high chair. And my son stayed in a high chair way longer than most children. I think we got rid of the, rid of the high chair when he was four because there was so much running around and we hadn't had time to deal with that with an ABA, uh, you know, uh, therapist. So I would, I would lock him into the, um, high chair and, uh, and when he was very little, I would feed him. So I was going through the different things and as I was doing it, I was saying, no, this is what I did when you were a baby and, and it would be a teaching time. And we started going through the thing. And I, so I, I said, you know, here comes the, the Blackberry as if when he was very little. And then in my head, we kind of progressed until he was a little bit older and I was using that teaching opportunity. And so first I said, you know what I would do to you? I would say, do you want more? And we would sign more. And if he didn't do it and I reached up, this morning and took his hands and made him do the more sign. He's like, mom, what are you doing? Right. But I wanted him to sort of get a feel. And I was sort of enjoying going through what the steps were that first we, we had him sign. And then eventually we would have him say, and we would say to him, say more. And eventually I would just hold up the spoon and he would say more and he would get one. And then eventually we would have him say more berry. Right. And then when he said more berry, he, and each time he would do, we, we went through like two years in 30 seconds this morning. Uh, so I had him say more berry. And then, uh, I had him say, I want more berry, right? We just kept adding and growing that sentence. And then eventually it was, he would get the berry and then he would have to say, thank you. And then he would have to say, uh, I want more berry, please. And then mom, can I have more berry, please? Right. All of those different things. It took us like a year and a half of intensive ABA therapy till we got to the point where he said, mom, can I have more berry, please? I actually, I'm, I think I'm lying. I think that was more like two years, right? But the thing is, is that when he had mom, can I have more berry, please? He had 3 million other sentences as well. It wasn't just that one sentence, right? So we, we start with these small things and we grow them, right? But, it, but we start with the manding cause it's easy. If it is. The child wants something, they request it, they get it. And children get that and they will start, it multiplies upon itself. Um, but learn how you get it to multiply on itself by going to I behavioral training. Watch what it does on the A word and then when you want to be able to do it, go there. Go to I behavioral training. I believe that that's one of the $7.50 modules. Treat yourself with it and watch that grow and grow and grow. You'll want to do another one. It's addictive. All right. Uh, we are going to take a short break and then we're going to be back with more of Autism Live. Stick with us. This is the second annual ACT Run for uh, Autism and Military Families. We're down here in San Diego. It's absolutely gorgeous morning. All right, let's just stop moving. Let's move in those feet. I know it's a little chilly. Some of you are just arriving. Hey, you guys are looking at it. I want to remind you, you are running to raise money for an amazing cause. Our military families with a child of autism. You guys are heroes. Thank you. So are you ready to run? Go!
someone who's had a lot of friends who have had children with autism, and I'll tell you, there is nothing more heartfelt than watching the support that this organization provides for families and for militaries and for children. Whoa, look at this little silver bullet on the side. He's going to win it. Oh, my gosh. Tackle him. Way to throw down a killer. Personal best, of course, on your act today, 10K. See, look at that. That is a serious commitment to no limits racing. You know, a lot of times you hear things about autism, you can, you're hearing about people trying to find a cure, but what happens to the people who are living with it daily with their ch children? And Act Today supports them with grants and funding for a helmet, for example. And they say in, in the lifetime of a child with autism, you can probably expect to spend about $3 million. So Act Today helps out with this. One in 88 military families have autism. That's entirely too much. We have an autism epidemic. It's almost impossible for families to get the care and treatment they need, particularly the military family who moves on average every two years. Oftentimes they have a parent deployed. Their children do not get the care and treatment they deserve. I hope all of you guys enjoyed running today. We're extremely humbled to get to be the title sponsor of this great event and it's gonna grow every year. We started off as a small company with a big vision and a few years later now, we've uh, donated over three quarters of a million dollars thanks to uh, generous support and generous marketing from our charitable partners. All right, here now we go. One, five, four, three, two, one. Yeah. This is International Beat Mega Radio Smasher. time of my life and I've never felt this way before yes I swear this is true and I owe it all to you oh I had the time of my life and I've never felt this way before and I swear this is true and I owe it all to you possible if we hadn't had the tremendous support of a sponsor. We encourage everybody, join us next year. The party's going to be bigger and better than ever. Welcome back to Autism Live. We are so thrilled and so fortunate and, uh, and beyond belief lucky because we have Dr. Jonathan Tarbox here with us in the studio. Now, he is the head of research and development for the Center for Autism and Related Disorders, and he's also the director of the Autism Research Group. And this is something that we have you speak about on a regular basis because it's an amazing organization. Thank you. And um, we talk about new, we'll introduce new stories about research all the time on the show uh, when we don't have you here uh, and and from time to time we'll go back and ask you to give us information because research is an important part of autism yes definitely absolutely and and there are a lot of things that um, uh, we we tend to cover a lot of the research stuff when we do let's talk autism with Shannon and Nancy we're two autism moms we don't, you know, I mean, we should never be let loose in a research study to try to figure out the heads or tails of it, right? But I think that's most autism parents. Of course, that's all parents. Yeah. We're, we're looking at it and CNN says X and we listen to the headline and hopefully we listen to the, you know, the opening paragraph, but our ability to discern and figure out what's going on is not what it should be. Um, or, or certainly, it's certainly not at the level that you can understand. Um, but we have a frustration sometimes because we look at it and go, why? 
Nancy and I have an expression saying, well, that's the duh heard round the world, right? <laughs> a new study that we covered today or um, earlier this week about said that teens on the autism spectrum are more likely to be bullied than their neurotypical peers. And right. Nancy and I said, well, there's a big duh, right? Um, right? Don't right. we already know this? Right. And, and so I love when you come in because, first of all, your organization is about doing research that's meaningful. That makes a difference in the yes. lives of families living with autism, right? Yes. And, you know, the fact of the matter is, um, probably 80 or 90 percent of research on autism that's funded by the government, that's funded by um, you know foundations, and gets published in scientific journals doesn't help anybody at all. Uh, and it might pose uh, you know a, a possibility of helping somebody in the future based on its implications. Uh, for example, you know before you can get funding to fix a problem like bullying, maybe you need to scientifically demonstrate that it is a problem, right? right. And that's all well and good. But still, at the end of the day, okay, how long does it take to to demonstrate the obvious and how many millions are we going to spend on demonstrating the obvious before we actually how about just help somebody or right. fix a problem that that's a Im very important aspect of research and that is what your organization is devoted to that's right we should say though that you know so often until in order to get somebody to fund something you know a, a research study will come out and they'll say but we need to know more right. and there have to be more research studies and, there, and then it has to be replicated that's and there correct. are rules in the scientific community before we can say beyond all shadow of a doubt that X times Y equals 32A, right? <laughs> right, exactly right. And you know, and even then you never say beyond all shadow of a doubt. You just say something like it's it's overwhelming, you know, there's overwhelming evidence that okay. X, Y, and Z is going to be helpful or that we need to provide X, Y, and Z treatment. So for example, when ABA was first being started with kids with autism in the 1960s, there were only a few studies, there were very minor studies. No one said, yes, this is an effective treatment yet right. for children on the spectrum. What they said was a lot more replication is needed, right? And so they and so instead of just complaining about that and doing the treatment anyways, which is what honestly a lot of uh, folks in the autism community do, ABA folks buckled down and did the research yeah. and now here we are 40 years later maybe eight nine hundred studies published and now uh, it's very easy to say that the amount of evidence is overwhelming right and and I'm so glad you went there because that's where I was going next we um, we talk on this show a lot about ABA and this year we're really focusing on quality ABA great and the thing that I I, I want everybody to know is that that research has been done right yeah well research has been done that shows what works for sure and right. so to, to make sure that your the program that your child is getting is good quality it's just a matter of comparing it to what's actually been published and what what has been shown to work in research and really it's it's not that hard I mean I don't mean to say it that way but it's it, it shouldn't be hard for the ABA provider to say yes we're doing that or no we're not doing that right. you know things like simple things like collecting data on a regular basis every single major published outcome study has collected thorough data on every Everything that you're doing with the child all day, every day, period. Right. So that's been shown to work. Right. Um, you know, um, intensive supervision. Every major outcome study had intensive supervision of the child's case uh, by uh, masters or doctoral level folks who are experts in supervising ABA programs. Right. Not a single published outcome study has shown that um, someone at a bachelor's level with a couple years' experience can kind of just do it on their own. Yeah. Not a single study has shown that parents can just do it on their own. No matter how well trained the parents are, no matter how passionate they are there's no research to suggest that's going to work so so yeah there, there's there's been lots of studies that show here are all the individual components that work and so it's a matter of saying, okay, this is what my child is receiving. Here's my child's program. Which components line up with the research and which ones don't? And, and we all have emotions, right? Let's, let's be very clear about that. We all have emotions about what we want to work, what we think works, what we think we've seen with our child that works. Right. And I don't think for a second, Dr. Tarbox, that you're suggesting that it's outside the realm of possibility that, some, that a parent can be effective at creating progress. What you're simply stating, and I just want to reiterate, is that we have had studies that have shown well yeah let me yeah let me let me clarify what I meant by that is there's no research suggesting that um, parents can completely do all of the work that has been done in the past by professionals okay. to treat their children however research has shown that it's critical for parents to be involved yes. and, re and research has shown that parents can make a huge difference for their kids things yeah. like decreasing tantrums increasing uh, independent communication toileting uh, lots of major important bread-and-butter 
skills and behaviors yeah. can be improved in the home setting by the parents, right? Yeah. Um, and, and I'm not saying that's not critical. It's critical. Yeah. What I'm, all I'm saying is it's not a replacement for professionally delivered intensive therapy. Yeah. And, and, and my point is that if, if you know that you've got an issue, and, and let's say that you're a parent, you've got a child that's recently been diagnosed, and you know you've already, you're already seeing challenging behavior, you're already at a level of frustration. Um, you've got some decisions you have to make about how much do you want to try to invent a wheel, and how much do you want to lean into the science that's already there. That's right. And a lot of us as parents have said, I don't have time to try to invent a new wheel. This has been shown to work. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to chase the science. Right, chase the science. And try we, that and we've first. We've had a lot of luck. And 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 you know, and give it a wholehearted effort. And yeah. and like anything else, if you don't see progress, then don't just say, "Oh, well, too bad. That's what I'm supposed to have." Demand progress, yeah. right, for your child. And if that if that provider is not producing or if that treatment pr approach is not producing it, ask for a different provider. Ask for a higher quality provider. Yeah. Interview some others. Ask what their qualifications are. And f and eventually maybe I suppose it's possible that their kid just isn't going to learn in an ABA program. I've never seen that even once, right. but theoretically, I guess even that's possible, right? And maybe it's time to learn, uh, seek out something else. And, and one of the reasons why I'm asking you to go back over this was we had the question of the day today. The question of the day today was, how has your life changed since ABA started? And we've had some people write in and say, oh, you know, my child's more independent, my child's this. Um, but, but we, of course, have had some people who have written in and said, we did ABA and we stopped. Right, sure. Because, and overwhelmingly, they say, it was hard to make the rest of our lives work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, and we talked about what one parent had written in and that now we've had another parent who's written in and said, you know, it was just so complicated and they got so frustrated. And I, I want other parents that are, they're watching to know I, you know, I had frustration and our lives, I'm not, I'm not candy coating it. Our lives, I always would say somebody picked up our house and shook it. And then there right. were a whole bunch more people in the house. <laughs> right. Right? right. Right. And yeah. there were ramifications to that. And it was not a tea party. No. Um, it, it was not, you know, every moment, happy, happy, happy. Right. It was some of the hardest years of my life, but it was so worth it. Right. Right. But I also know that I had the benefit of the very best of quality ABA therapy. Right. And and of course, not every provider is the same. And right. some uh, many families will have an experience with a low quality provider that doesn't actually cause progress to occur for their child. Yeah. And that's not acceptable. And if and if and if you're if you're finding that with your child, if you're seeing that a, a real significant lack of progress, you need to de demand better. And. And maybe you can help, because one of the things that um, the second parent wrote in and said uh, that their provider, there was such turnover that right. they felt like they were constantly starting over and that what eventually did it was that she walked in to see the tutor sitting with her child texting on the phone. And and here's the thing that I that I want to say is that and I appreciate you sharing that that was what your experience of ABA is, but I, I maybe you can help me because when somebody has had that experience, right? I don't know how to explain to them that rancid, uh, you know, really fetid, horrible, diluted skim milk yogurt, frozen yogurt is not the same thing as a Dutch chocolate, full butter fat right. ice cream. Right. And How you know, do you explain the difference between those two? Well, and but the fact of the matter is it's not just ABA. It's it's in every area of human services. Yes. There's a huge range of quality, you know. So if you compare the worst medical clinic in the country to Johns Hopkins Hospital, it wouldn't even be recognizable as the same thing in terms right. of medical treatment, right? Um, if you go to the worst mechanic in some shack, you know, back of some hill in the middle of nowhere and compare that to, you know, a top quality auto mechanic shop, Again, totally different services that you're going to get, even though they're both mechanics, right? Yeah. And again, that goes across every area of human endeavor. No matter what humans do, there's a huge range of quality. Yeah. And that's very true with ABA. And the lower end of the quality spectrum of ABA is totally unacceptable. Yeah. And it is part of what we need to do as an industry in ABA and as, as a discipline is to raise the bar across, yeah. you know, across the board. Uh, and there's, you know, we could talk about that forever, but there's a lot of development initiatives that we're working on at CARD and that a lot of folks in the field 
field they're working on to try to set standards higher. And, and I will say this too, you can be with a really quality ABA provider with a fabulous BCBA and a team of rock star therapists, you're still going to have some turnover sure. and you're still going to train and every once in a while you're still going to get a therapist that is not the therapist sure. that needs to be working with and your kid. it's totally fine to request that therapist to be changed. And you should and you must and yeah. and and but but I, I, my heart bleeds for these parents who have stopped something yeah. um, that really their child has the benefit of and they don't even know that they've stopped a bad thing and haven't ever had right. the good thing. Well, and there's, and there's multiple different things that could be, go could be going on. It could be that the, the quality of their program was so lousy that their child wasn't progressing, and that would kind of make sense to stop that. If yeah. you didn't know any better, if you think, well, yeah, that's ABA, then yeah, get rid of it. You know? yeah. so, it's, so it could be that they just needed a better provider. But another uh, point that maybe one of your viewers raised is just this issue of disrupting your life, where it totally turns your life upside yes. down, even if it is good quality, even if your child is making progress. If that means that no one else, no, none of the other kids in the house get to feel special, or the husband or wife never get any time alone because all their time is spent planning for the program, mm -hmm. you know, et cetera, et cetera, I, I get that. That's, you know, that can I be disastrous too. in itself. And so, you know, when I talk to families about this, I always go back to the um, Olympic athlete, uh, athlete training analogy, and that is, um, what if you thought your kid had a shot at being a gold medal gymnast or a gold medal skier? What would you do for your family to give that gift to your child, right? Yeah. Um, and if you really thought there's a decent chance they have a shot at that, what would you do? And what families do in those circumstances is a lot like what we do in ABA. Yeah. And that is the whole family rearrange, rearranges their whole life around this project. And it's key to make, you know, all the siblings feel involved. It's key to involve all the parents, siblings, grandparents, everybody, so that they have a special and important role. So they're not just, you know, pushed aside, <laughs> I'll deal with you in a couple of years, honey, when I have time, yeah. but rather bring them in, give them a, a job or, or a task that makes them feel special and that, that is genuinely critical to the whole project. Yeah. And and just acknowledge that you're you're gonna be tired for three or four years. You're not gonna you're not gonna feel well rested and sane for years. Yeah, I I think about a very dear friend of our show who has a child on the autism spectrum, and uh, two weeks ago now, the the child was exhibiting uh, they they're having trouble breathing and having some chest pain, mm. and within four days they discovered that it was lymphoma. Oh my goodness! Right, and 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 the things that I have uh, seen and heard from what she's posted on Facebook that they have changed in the last two weeks because they had to because they had to. Um, he's already started his chemotherapy and the things wow. that she has had to go through and language with her child. I am so impressed with this mom. Um, so they're dealing with autism and lymphoma. And, and fortunately, you know, um, it's, it's a cancer that's very treatable. And so the prognosis is stellar, right? But there is a period of time that she knows I got to walk through this valley that is not going to be pleasant and she just man straightened up her spine and said i am going to do this and it's it's truly been inspirational um because you know <laughs> that that's not a place that she wants to go and something that she wants to do but she's getting it done it's the challenge of her life it is her it life is. will be defined by that challenge absolutely and and you know it's inspiring a lot of us as well in the community to, to watch how how quickly because i got to tell you i would be on the floor saying why me for at least a week and, and i would <laughs> be too. like and i am entitled to that <laughs> that i that i have that owed to me right <laughs> and she didn't have time for that i'm sure that she will experience that somewhere down the road and we will hang on to her when she's going through that but she's walking that and getting it done because it, it's what she had to do so uh, and i and i would say to you that as an autism family you know I think the families that do well and stick in with ABA make that kind of a determination for themselves and say, right. we're going to do what we have to do because we have to, and we'll, we'll, we'll find what's wonderful about it. The irony is when it's over, we mourn it. We mourn it. And, and, I, and I tell you that honestly, I said to somebody the other day, because we had so little time for ourselves when we were doing therapy, we found every single moment. And I'm not as good at doing that now. Yeah, sure. I have Makes to sense. up that. When the last therapist would leave, 
we would put music on and we would have four minutes of dancing in the living room as a family. And we would just go crazy and shake it all off. Dinner would be cooking and we would just be nutty. And we don't do that anymore, right? right? Because we have more time in which to do that, so we don't. I encourage you, uh, you know, take the journey. It's so valuable. It's so valuable. It's the best journey you'll ever go on. All right, we have to take a break. But when we come back, we're also going to talk with Dr. Tarbox. We've been talking all week long about advances. Uh, this whole month is about advances in the field of autism. And we're focusing this week on adva advances in behavioral treatment. So we're going to pick his brain a little bit about some of the things that he's been to conferences that are really exciting, uh, that are really adding to our community. So stick with us. Hi! Welcome to Camp Discovery, a free-to-play suite of fun, interactive learning games for kids 2 and up, designed by experts in autism. Camp Discovery will open your early learner to a world of new skills, shapes, numbers, colors, locations, emotions, and more. Let's get started! Please choose a level. Objects! First, Camp Discovery's intelligent preference assessment determines your child's preferred reward for choosing correctly. Okay, got it! Let's play! Camp Discovery creates a motivating learning environment for your child by minimizing incorrect responses and maximizing successful ones. Find the shoes. Respond correctly and your child is rewarded with their favorite animations. You did it! Respond incorrectly and our unique prompting system guides your child to the correct answer by making it the largest choice. That's not it. Try again. Way to go! Continue to answer correctly and the size gradually reduces until the child makes the correct choice independently. You win! Success! Rewards motivate learning. Complete a round and your child is rewarded with a fun mini game. Track your child's progress with easy to read graphs. Multiple settings options allow you to customize Camp Discovery to your child's unique needs. All this in one single app, the Camp Discovery app available for free on iTunes, Google Play, and Amazon Store. Welcome back to Autism Live. We call this part of the show Science Beat with Dr. Tarbox because we have Dr. Jonathan Tarbox here with us. And I always like to say he has a beautiful mind. And uh, I, I love the fact that when you went off to college that you did not plan to be working in the field of autism. Not at all. Um, but you met a mom, an autism mom, and everything changed from there. That's and you, right. you, you delved into it. And, and thank goodness for all of us. Thank goodness you did. Sometime I want to meet that mom or send her a card. Yeah, I, I want to look her up, actually. <laughs> you know, and say thank you, because do you realize what you did for Absolutely. all of us? How many lives that she has impacted by being the mom who said, I need to have some uh, college students to work with my child? And, you know, what inspired me more than anything with her was, uh, you know, the ABA was great, the kid was great, everything else, but really, honestly, what really hooked me was the mom's passion and yeah. the mom's dedication. And the mom, you know, her willingness to behave fearlessly, yeah. even though her life was in terror at the moment, uh, you know? Yeah. And she just did whatever it took. I don't know where she found the courage or how she did it, but she just dug down deep and just made her child's program happen, even though there was no services, no support, no one else was paying yeah. for it, nothing. She just figured out how to make it work. And she cobbled together a program out of some college kids, you know, tutors. We didn't know anything. Um, and she made it happen. And her kid really benefited a lot. And and ultimately, our entire community benefited a lot because you you went into this field uh, all the way. You just dove in headlong. And you, as I mentioned before, you're the head of research and development at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. And all this week, we've been talking about advances. In this month, we've been talking about advances. Last week, we were talking about advances in technology. And this week, I wanted to focus on advances in, in behavioral treatment which sometimes dovetails with technology because we're exactly. using more technology in behavioral treatment. But so tell us some of the things. I know recently you went to Cal mm -hmm. ABBA mm -hmm. um, and, and you do go to conferences from time to time. What really has been at the top of your mind that's exciting in this right. field? Well, there's almost too much to talk about as yeah. usual. You know, there's just so many facets. But um, one uh, speech that I saw at Cal ABBA that was really inspirational was um, by Dr. Martha Palayas, who who's a professor out in Florida, um, and she, <clears throat> she, her area of research is um, 
looking at very, very early child development in infancy um, and how what we do when we interact with our babies actually shapes their the very, very early development of sort of the sh social prerequisite behaviors. Um, and so she showed some, some very convincing experiments that showed basically that um, um, you know, well, first of all, uh, when you and I look at, let's say, a three-month-old or a six-month-old, you kind of think most of what they do is just kind of predetermined, right? right. It's just kind of they're just cute little squishy, giggly organisms. Right. They don't really, right? They're lovey uh, lumps. Yeah, they're just lovey lumps, <laughs> right? Well, actually, what her experiments show is that that's not the case at all. That yeah. that their their eye contact with other people, and that whether they look at you or look away, and whether they vocalize, is completely affected by how we interact with them. Wow. And so, what she showed was, um, and and th the good news is, what her data showed was kind of just common sense, good parenting. Uh, but what they showed was, if you look at your kid a lot, if you make eye contact with your kid, they're going to look at you back more. Yeah. Okay. So if they look at you, and your reaction is to look at them, then that reinforces. The them looking at you. Yeah. Okay, so you actually, so she actually showed increased rates of eye contact with babies uh, when parents made eye contact back as a reinforcer. Okay, um, and these were all babies who were at risk, so they had various at risk. Um, right. Uh, things going on, parents uh, who had uh, maybe a developmental disability or parents who were uh, 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 drug addicts, things uh -huh. like that, um, or, or chronically siblings. depressed, and, and siblings, exactly. Uh -huh. So all different risk factors, not necessarily for only autism, but for um, developmental challenges in general. Okay. And so, so yeah, reacting to your child with on eye contact improves their eye contact and gets them engaged more. Yeah. Um, another thing was... Um, imitating your child's vocalizations. So around six months old, uh, typically developing kids will start to make some kind of sounds, right? Yeah. And so if you react to your infant sounds by making sounds, it increases how much they make sounds. Wow. And so you're actually teaching them to speak at six months old without even meaning to, right? right? So if you or I sit down with a cute little baby and they make some kind of sound, we're very likely to actually imitate it. We don't do it on purpose, right. we just do it because it's just cute, happens. right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and it's fun for us, it's reinforcing. So what she showed very systematically was when you do that more, the infant vocalizes more. If you do that less, the infant vocalizes less. Wow. So it's not just a matter of being present. It's a matter of responding to your child when they yeah. behave towards you. You yeah. need to respond back immediately and positively, wow. right? And it doesn't have to be fake or contrived. Just have fun. You know, yeah. do what is sort of normally fun and cute, but do it as a consequence for the child's behavior. So if they're responding to you in any way, looking at you, making any kind of vocalizations towards you, it's time to vocalize right back. Right? Amazing Very stuff. Very interesting stuff. Because it's mindful parenting. I think That's a right. lot of it people are doing anyway, but if we know that it just does that much more, then we're doing mindful parenting and we're making those inroads. That's it's right. not to say that we didn't do those things for the autism parents. No, uh, not at because all. Because we did. Although as I'm hearing you speak, I'm remembering that with my son, and I know this is under TMI, but you know, <laughs> I breastfed and um, and from the time he was, you know, a week and a half old, he he had some issues with breastfeeding and mm -hmm. we went and and we talked and one of the things that would happen is if if he was latched on and I made eye contact with him he would unlatch no kidding and one so of the things that was said was well then don't look at him while he's right. latching and right. I wish I could go back and do that over again right yeah although you know maybe you know it, it could go either way because right. maybe he just really didn't want eye contact right then yeah. and honestly latching on and breastfeeding is more important than anything else it right was then, in the right? moment and that's so, why the, yeah. the La Leche coach said that that, right, but right. I wish that I had understood what I know now sure, because yeah. I would have said, okay, we're going to get this and, and then, then we're going to work, gonna work on contact. this every yeah. day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he can, he made great eye, eye contact right up until uh, right around his second birthday, mm -hmm. but just not while he was breastfeeding. Right. That yeah. was just so. not allowed. I don't want to <laughs> look at you and do this. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Um, so, but mindful parenting, yeah. really remarkable. And you know, um, another, if I may, another yes. um, detail that she showed in some of her research was um, uh, some things that are not so great. So, you know, what's great is yes. mindful parenting, responding to your child when they respond to you in any way. Um, things that are not so great is uh, flat affect. Really interesting. Oh, okay. So she actually showed in experiments that if the mother just has a flat face with no expression at all, not a negative expression, right. but not a positive one, just no affect, um, 
that that actually will decrease the child's behavior of looking at the parent. Interesting. So you can actually decrease your child, your baby's eye contact and vocalizations if you have flat affect. Okay. So it's very important to have a responsive face in, in response to your child. And again, we're not talking about some weird, robotic, repetitive, contrived thing. Right. Just smile if your baby Enjoy smiles. Them. You know, yeah. that's all it comes down to. Yeah, right? it really does. Um, and so things like, so things that we do in our daily life all of the time that I have a feeling are not so great for this are, let's say, look looking at our phones, yes. looking at our iPads, yes. watching TV. So while you're hanging out with your infant, of course it's understandable that you need a break too. And so yeah. it's understandable and you need to check your email and you need to check in with friends. Um, but just be really mindful of the amount of time that you spend looking at a screen because what, what does your face do when you're looking at a screen? It, it becomes flat. It really does. Right? And, and it's not looking at the baby. So if you have yeah. your baby here and a screen there, you're having flat affect and you're looking away yeah. and you're actually missing a lot, right? Yeah. So do your screen time, but limit it and yeah. make sure that you're doing a lot more of FaceTime with the baby. I absolutely love this. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, that so was quick. It was, it was very quick. <laughs> uh, we have one extra guest at the end of the show uh, today and so that's why it's a little bit quick. But I thank you so much for being here. Sounds we'll have you here. back next week. Sounds good. And, uh, and, and if you have questions in the meantime for Dr. Tarbox, please feel free to send them in on the live feature because uh, we always try to share those with him ahead of time. We are going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to have Sarah Gershfeld here with us from Love My Provider. You are going to love this. So stick with us. Skills is an online program that provides assessment, curriculum, positive behavior support planning for challenging behavior and progress tracking, and it does this all in one place. The skills assessment and curriculum addresses eight areas of development, which even includes advanced higher level areas such as executive functions and cognition, which pretty much makes skills the only ABA-based set of curricula for teaching more complex skills, things like problem solving, planning, self-management, perspective taking, and even inferring and predicting others' private events. Skills is a four-step system. Step one is to add the child to your account. Step two is to start assessment. The skills assessment is the only ABA-based assessment with psychometric research demonstrating the language subscale to have excellent reliability. Every area of human functioning and typical child development from infancy to adolescence was researched, making the skills assessment the most comprehensive of its kind in the world, and we're quite proud of that. Skills is easy to use. Simply click Start Assessment and begin answering questions, or simply type in a keyword find specific activities to assess, and add activities to treatment. Step three, choose activities. Once you've completed the assessment, Skills selects from a pool of 4,000 activities categorized by age, level, and skill type to provide you with exactly those activities each child needs. Start by choosing a curriculum, then a lesson, and finally an activity. Click the information icon to view prerequisites, ages in which targets develop, examples, and IEP goals. Click the video icon to watch a short video. Once you've identified an activity you want to teach, adding activities to treatment is a snap. Step four, start treatment. Here you can access customizable activity lesson details, add your own customized targets and exemplars, and edit an activity status such as introducing or mastering it. You can even print handouts such as worksheets, tracking forms, visual aids, and other materials. Skills also offers multiple progress charts, mapping curriculum progress, lesson progress, and cumulative number of activities and targets mastered over time. The skills language curriculum is categorized by verbal behavior type so that users can identify progress for verbal operants, such as echoics, mans, tax, and interverbals. Skills is one of the only programs that provides the ability to write behavior intervention plans, or BIPs, for challenging behavior. With just a few clicks, the outline of the behavior intervention plan is written for you and ready to be printed and implemented. You can learn more about Skills today and get started by visiting us at www.skillsforautism.com or you can call us at 877-975-4559. Skills. Progress starts here.
Welcome back to Autism Live. We are finishing out the week with something truly amazing. We have with us here in the studio live, Sarah Gershfeld. Welcome. Thank you. And you are from Love My Provider. Please tell us what Love My Provider is because I love it. Thank you. So <laughs> Love My Provider is essentially your Yelp rating site for families who have special needs children. So um, my background is I'm a clinician. I've worked with children on the spectrum for years. I've worked with insurance companies, regional centers, school districts. Um, and as I've worked with a lot of those different funding sources, I've realized there's this huge disparity with the quality of services that exist out there for children on the spectrum. And I realized that when a parent first gets diagnosed, they get this long list of providers that they could choose from. And what I realized is that they typically talk to other parents to figure out what that what provider they should go with, or they have to call every single one of them by themselves and figure it out from scratch. So they're essentially doing the work over again that many parents have already done. And so when I was looking at this problem, I realized it's so easy for us to go on Yelp and find a hamburger joint that everyone likes. And why shouldn't it be that easy to make an actually important decision, like which provider your child is going to be seeing for the next year or two? So I came up with this idea of creating this uh, Yelp-like site, and it's officially live as of last week. It's called Love my provider, so you can go online and check it out. You can search for providers. Right now, we let, we have uh, behavior analysts, we have occupational therapists, physical therapists, and speech therapists. And within the next few weeks, we'll be expanding out to dentists, doctors, and also trying to reach the greater Los Angeles area and beyond. Remarkable. And so people can go to lovemyprovider.com, mm -hmm. and they have the opportunity to. There, there's a way that they can register so that they can. But you can see information right away. Or do they have to register before they can? We actually have a lot of information open to okay. non-signed-in non users, and we want parents to easily be able to access mm -hmm. it. But what we've realized is that these families, if you notice, a lot of the providers are actually listed on Yelp. They just don't have any reviews. And we realize that they are not leaving reviews because they want to remain anonymous. They mm -hmm. don't want their name attached to a review because even if they're not happy with the provider, they still have to work with them. Yes. So they don't want to leave something there that will be tied back to their name and they're worried it might affect their services in some way. So we have the provider's information, which, which you know, insurance companies and regional centers they work with. Mm -hmm. uh, we have their address, their social media links, and a description. But in order to see their reviews, you actually have to sign in. Okay, so, but there's no cost for that. No, we should let people know. Service. No cost for it at all, and it's a wealth of information. And if you already are working with a provider, you can go there and go in and rate your provider. Sure. So because we're fairly new, we're really looking to parents to go online right now and start leaving their opinions. That's the first step. Is This is a resource that's necessary, but it can't be useful to new parents unless the parents who've already been yeah. there go in and leave their opinions about the experiences that they've had. Uh, there's also a function if you don't see a provider listed, you can add one. So you can fill out a form and we'll quickly add the provider to the database. Um, for the providers out there, if you see that your information is incorrect, you can go online and also switch your information so that you can update it. Maybe you're working with a new insurance company or you no longer work work with a particular school district so that the information remains up to date. I have to say, I, I just love this idea. And, and honestly, one of the things that I, I find really exciting, you and I went on the site together the other day, mm -hmm. and I had said to you that uh, it was last year that I was looking for an OT provider. And I didn't even know where to begin, and so I started making phone calls and asking other parents. But I loved that with you, I was able to go on, and not only could I see a bunch of OT providers, but I could see how far away they were. Okay. It gives me the mile rating of how close. And last night, I was uh, in a back and forth e email with a parent who had gotten a funding source that had hooked her up with a provider that is so far away from her that she's been having to drive an hour each way to get to the provider. And then she found out that a top quality provider is around the corner from her. Oh, wow. And now she's having to go through the process of trying to switch and justify to the funding source why she wants to switch. And it's a it's really taxing, and she's saying she may lose her services for a period of time. And had she had the ability on that first day to go on your site and look at who are the ABA providers, how are they rated, and who's close to me, and look, there is a really great rated provider that's close to me, she could have saved herself all of this trouble and heartache and the potential that 
she was saying to me this morning that she may lose therapy for as long as six months if she says, I don't want to travel that far. Right. And that's definitely a problem that a lot of our families seen. And I saw it firsthand as well. I noticed these uh. families who were so unhappy and they would try switching services. And even if they do spend those six months looking for a new provider or waiting, there's still parents who are just making the same decision because they don't know any better. Yeah. And so we're trying to kind of stop the problem where it begins as opposed to trying to backtrack once we realize that our kids are not working with the right people or yeah. you know, there are some of those difficulties that they run into. It, it seems like every autism parent at some point, the, the sentence comes out of your mouth, I just wish somebody had told me, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what Love My Provider does. Yeah. We actually had an interesting collaboration with Northwestern University. Yes. So um, their business school uh, has a research methodology class. and. We we were able to come in contact with them and a group of very talented MBA students put together a comprehensive research study for us and they interviewed about 300 parents who are on the spectrum and really were able to identify what's most important for them in a provider, which are the most difficult providers for them to find. We also were able to identify the distance, for example, yeah. in terms of a rating if you're looking for a provider, which are most important and least important. And the site is based on these studies. So it's really something that we really hope will address the needs of a lot of a fam the families out there. I, I absolutely love it and really want to encourage people to go to the site lovemyprovider.com. Participate. Mm -hmm. it, it really is as good as we will participate in it and it, we all have a stake in this mm -hmm. um, because not only will it help us to make decisions in the future and not only does it give us a, a some recourse if you're working with a provider who isn't great saving somebody else from doing it without affecting your relationship with the professionals that you're working with but but also i would imagine that providers are going to pay attention and we're going to we want to be quality control and and make sure that everybody's getting that quality aba and if they are aware of the fact that people can give them a lesser rating maybe some of these aba providers will clean up their act a little bit yeah and i think we don't want it to be this negative place at all. No. What we're finding is that a lot of these large companies out there, they have wait lists, they have you know, a lot going on. And so I see this also as a storefront for these small businesses who might yeah. be doing a really great job, yes. but no one knows about them. And if those small businesses go on and say, hey, you know, you like our services, come share your story, then these parents who are sitting there on a six month waiting list can just go with a provider that might be doing just as good of a job. Absolutely, it's a win, 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 win. Mm -hmm. uh, we thank you for being thank with you. us and we thank you for for having this site and having somebody as knowledgeable as you be the person who's driving this site. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. All right, we are really out of time here, but I want to take just a moment to talk about the fact that next week, as we look, we continue our month of talking about advances in autism, we're really going to be looking at what some of the medical advances are in autism. And, and that's a very exciting topic. So that we, we hope that you will be with us starting on Tuesday. Also want to say out there to everyone, if you are loving this show and you find that you're getting good information here, make sure that you're sharing it with other people. Uh, like us on Facebook, sign up for our newsletter, and you have the ability on your social networking to let other people know how they can gain access to this important information that we're sharing as well. We hope that you will. We only work when we have viewers, and the more viewers we have, the more things we can do here with you. So please participate with us in that way. We are out of time, but as I always like to say to all of you, please give your kiddos a hug from me and remember to be kind to yourself. Oh, and before we go, uh, I'm going to interrupt myself for a second. Don't forget to go to our blog right now. We have a meditation, a free meditation that you can download that is for overwhelmed parents. I hope that if you're having any strife in your life, you'll listen to it and that it will help you to breathe a little bit better and get through a stressful time easier. We're completely out of time. Emily's going to boot me out of the studio, but thank you so much for being with us. Bye-bye for now.